Good evening, Town of Essex residents. It's Heritage Week, and this year's theme seeks to explore the lost settlements of Essex. With me tonight to my left is prominent local African-Canadian heritage consultant, Elise Harding Davis. She is also the recipient of the 2021 Community Heritage Preservation Award presented by the Town of Essex. Tonight, Elise will be delivering a talk on Essex County's Lost Black Cemeteries. Her talk will help tell the tales of Black pioneers, freedom fighters, and escaped slaves, all of whom became part of the Black thread in the Canadian tapestry. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Elise. I'm going to shut my camera off and I'm going to begin the presentation. Hi, Rita. Thank you so much for the introduction. I would like to talk about the lost of Black cemeteries of Essex County because it's such an important process. This cover features several of the cemeteries that we're going to talk about and we'll just get started. Essex County's Black cemeteries are scattered throughout the county. Many people have a love of cemeteries. There is a certain sense of connection and satisfaction one gets from prowling around in a graveyard, reading the information on the old weathered headstones. Through the mists of times, burials and its habits have defined mankind. From ancient times, the treatment of human remains has been sacrosanct, a special task full of ceremony and reverence. Burial practices and rituals are a sign and show of progress of peoples and cultures. Preserving the bodies of kings and the lowly has re revealed our humanity and cohesion, lifting us above lesser animals. Rich and poignant tributes to ordinary loved ones, to heroes and royalty have been unearthed and studied around the world. Notable are the Taj Mahal, and the Great Pyramids of Egypt. Unlike Black cemeteries in the United States, here in Canada, we didn't actually have segregated cemeteries. It wasn't legislated that uh, things be strictly segregated here. When the Black thread in the Canadian tapestry reached freedom in this country, churches were built, graveyards were established, and dignified burial grounds were conducted forever interring these pioneers in sacred soil. African Canadian graveyards were not segregated by law, but deliberately apart. The ceremonial acts helped repatriate us to the human family after enslavement, where we were not considered human beings. Dignified and ritualized holy burials gave us back our status as persons rather than objects or property to be discarded thoughtlessly or irresponsibly. Formal funerals were carried out by our own ministers in the warm protection of our families and community which strengthened our ties and gave us meaning. We gained a true and much longed for sense of security and independence. Additionally, our cemeteries act as the keepers of our history. Our tombstones are the tellers of our tales. Bold inscriptions like born in Kentucky speak volumes, rescuing us from obscurity and places us in the ongoing history of Canada. Whether or not we know the individuals buried or not, we can understand the importance of why we need to preserve these cemeteries. We walk carefully around each plot. Their lives take on meaning to us. Each person reaches out and touches us. My mind builds images of these graveyard residents. Who were they? Why did they come here? What happened to them in their lives? How did they die? 
the substance of their existence matters to me and many others. Without their efforts, major or minor, our lives would be very different today. We might not even be located here, much less exist. I invite you to link in and take part in exploring Essex County's lost black cemeteries. This map is Essex County. It was previously known as the County of Hess in official records. At this time, the 1792 timeframe, there were less than 4,000 residents in the entire county. The LaSalle area, south of Amherstburg, was a First Nations indig Indigenous reserve. Here are eight black cemeteries in Essex County, circa 1850. Former slaves created productive, lucrative homesteads in Essex County. These pioneering freedom fighters carved out lives their ancestors would not have ever imagined. They owned land, educated their children, praised God as they saw fit, and buried their dead with dignity. Vestiges of these settlements still remain. In today's climate, with property more precious than ever, finding land to build on is harder and harder. Of all sites, old cemeteries are most at risk of becoming parking lots and or subdivisions. There are unscrupulous developers who go after these abandoned sanctuaries, black and white, thinking no one is left from these once flourishing communities that spawn them or that no one cares enough to speak up and stop them from disrespecting the sacred remains of people who were the founders of this country. When did they get here? Records show that there was a black presence in Canada as early as 1604. Matthew da Costa, a black seaman trained in Portugal at the school of Henry the Navigator, assisted Samuel James de Champlain, whom we all know from our history books, in helping the French arrive in Canada. Da Costa spoke several different languages and interpreted between the Mi'kmaq Indians, as they were called at that time, and the French. In my mind, that might indicate that a black man had large responsibility in the French even settling in Canada. Think about that. As early as 1787, refugee slaves escaped here. They had fought during the War of Independence. Where did they come from? African origin people came to Canada as explorers and to seek freedom from enslavement and escape oppression and persecution based solely on the color of their skin, largely in the United States. Early attempts using European bond servants and indentured slaves was not very successful, was not very successful, excuse me, as white people could leave their communities and easily blend in in other places. The enslavement of Native Americans proved less than satisfactory also, based on the fact that First Nations peoples had a philosophy that wasn't conducive to slavery. Theirs was to share all and leave the rest. Black's coloration stood out, the perfect choice. They wanted the same opportunities as whites, land, education, business ownership, and the right to be 
real men and women raising their families in peace. Instead, they were placed in perpetual bondage for over 500 years. What did they do? These African-Americans were farmers owning substantial acreage worth thousands of dollars in Essex County in the late 1700s and forward. Applying the agricultural know-how they brought with them from slavery on Southern uh, American plantations. They were the workers. They knew how to grow things. It is said that the tobacco and tomato industries were introduced by Blacks when they settled in Southwestern Ontario. There were laborers who cleared vast expanses of timber, fathers and mothers of stable households, teachers, preachers, entrepreneurs, inventors, and masterful craftsmen with any of the trades and professions their white counterparts engaged in. Through the centuries, these African Canadians fought in all major confrontations on the North American continent, usually in segregated units, battling to keep this country free. Racism and prejudice surrounded them, but they prevailed, making a mighty mark upon this nation. The anti-Black racism that we are fighting today is the carryover. Where did they live? In Essex County, there were several small Black communities. Hope Town was located in Colchester Township and encompassed the original town of Harrow and was established in the 1700s. New Canaan settlement near Gesto had almost 300 pioneers, that is Black pioneers. Colchester Township boasted more than more Black residents than white in the 1861 census. That's amazing. Bereker, which had a post office in 1871, was located on Pike Road near Gilgal and had a sawmill. Gordon, which also had a post office in 1874, was a Black settlement just outside Amherstburg with a grist mill, a sawmill, and a quarry. Marble Village was in Anderton Township. New Salem and New California were in Gosfield Township. The Refugee Home Society had two locations, one in Sandwich West, the other in the Maidstone area, which was called Sandwich South at that time. Puce was also located in Maidstone. Windsor, Old Sandwich Town, New Detroit, which was called Tin Can City, River Canard, and Little River were inhabited by African Canadians. There was quite a presence. This map, circa 1803, I'm having a little trouble with my own, uh, there we go. It shows the road to the Negro purchase. Thomas Smith's papers showed the black settlement in Colchester Township. African Canadians came to Essex County and settled in the early to mid 1700s as refugee slaves and oppressed free blacks, fleeing tyranny, tyr excuse me, fleeing tyranny in the United States. Note the blue arrow, which shows and reads the road to the Negro purchase. This slide shows African Canadian settlements and adjacent cemeteries in Essex County. At the time of the writing of my book, which the cover you saw, there were 14 black cemeteries that were established 
we're finding more since that would be about 2000 or 2014. Black settlements in Colchester, as I said, started in the early, late 1700s, mid 1700s. This is a map that is at the North American Black Historical Museum, now called the Amherstburg Freedom Museum. Uh, and it is of so Colchester South circa 1878. Over the years, such settlements came and went leaving cemeteries vulnerable to time, weather, and worst of all, desecration and vandalism by man. Topsoil has been scooped up and sold from local black cemeteries. Gravestones erode and get broken and stolen. Sometimes grave markers from black burial grounds were put on display as macabre decorations in thoughtless people's private homes. This has been done to markers from white graves as well, but the ones that have done that with black markers are particularly egregious to me and my sector of society. Thankfully, there are a small number of caregivers who fiercely protect our ancestors' remains and the ground in which they rest, myself amongst them. If we neglect to protect these rare and invaluable black graveyards, nothing substantiating our existence and validating the part African Canadians played in the building of our great homeland will exist or remain. It will be as though we, the storied African Canadians, never existed ourselves. We owe our ancestors the same protection they accorded us by surviving capture in ancient Africa. They resisted slavery, safeguarding a small kernel of hope of liberty in their hearts. And they figured out how to get up and walk away from slavery to guarantee freedom for us, their cherished descendants. In order to do that many gave their lives, suffered horribly. Anything less than making sure our forebearers repose in pristine burial sites is not acceptable. We are obliged to repay such a phenomenal commitment. We are and must be our antecedents keepers. Without their consecrated cemeteries, there would be no tangible evidence that the African Canadians came, saw, and conquered, gracing Canada with a multicultural face from its very beginnings. We'll first look at the New Canaan, sometimes called Chavis or Davis Cemetery, located on the Gesto Road. County Road 12. The settlement spoken of where the colored people have penetrated into the woods is known as New Canaan. It is a prosperous settlement in which the element of progress is strikingly manifest. This beautiful farming town on the northern shore of Lake Erie contains a population not far from 350 of whom about 250 are colored persons. 36 colored people have penetrated further into the woods than any of the whites. They are scattered all through the township up to the sixth concession. They are settled both north and south of the old Malden Road. None would have ventured there but these black people. They are all anxious to own land. They go in anywhere they can make a claim and clear up a patch. What I've just read is an excerpt by Reverend William Ruth from the book by Benjamin Drew, 
Narratives of Fugitive Slaves in Canada. Now, Canaan, speaking to Nate New Canaan, was reportedly a, Simpson, a synonymous code word to Canada. Next is the BME Center in Harrow, Ontario at 25 Walnut Street. You know, it looks beautiful in the picture now. And if you go almost any time of year, there's some color with blooming. When I first saw this cemetery, it was overgrown weeds as high as me, broken cemetery markers piled up against a tree. It took 40 years to have this municipally dedicated. A lot of work by a lot of people, black and white, and it's a wonderful, wonderful sight. When an anti-black slavery bill was passed in 1793, Ontario became a safe haven for escaped slaves. Still others fought with Great Britain against the fledgling United States of America in 1776 during the War of Independence as Black United Empire loyalists. Thousands of Blacks volunteered and fought ferociously with the British during the War of 1812 and the Rebellion of 1837-38, fearing they and their families would be returned to slavery if the invading Americans won. As a result, men, women, and children of African origins became pioneers and nation builders here in Essex County. British Methodist Episcopal Church site on Walnut began as an African Methodist Episcopal Church gathering place under the auspices of the Mother Bethel AME Church in Philadelphia, USA. And we had circuit rider ministers who visited different churches within, in uh, southwestern Ontario. The early congregation was comprised of pioneering African-Canadian community members, and uh, some had never been enslaved. All came to pursue their own dreams, own property, worship as they saw fit, educate their children, and raise their families in peace. I keep repeating these comments because again, in today's anti-Black racist society, we need to understand that we came here for the same reasons European immigrants did. Now is uh, St. Mark Cemetery on Dunn Road in uh, Colchester near Essex, formerly Harrow. This site contains the remains of black pioneers dating back to the early 1800s. Burials still take place at this cemetery. St. Mark's is much older, the cemetery itself is much older than the original church uh, that was built in Colchester Village in 1890. The original congregation of the African Methodist Episcopal denomination dates back to the mid 1800s, early 1800s, um, one individual buried in the original cemetery, which is at the back of the cemetery site, behind a small knoll, is Nelson Pettiford, who was born circa 1795 in the United States. He was a private in Captain Caldwell's company in 1837, and Captain Nelson's company in 1838. He was listed in the 1845 Colchester census as a farmer. Also located in the old part of this cemetery is Reverend William Ruth, whom I referred to when I was reading about New Canaan. 
He was born in 1779 in the United States and came to Colchester in 1825. By 1856, he owned a cleared 50 acres on a farm in Colchester Village and 70 acres in the bush in New Canaan. He was a positive force in our community. He urged our people to seek education as the key to economic well being. And of course, as I said, was quoted in Benjamin Drew's book, Reverend Ruth died in 1863. Now we're at going to talk about Central Grove Church and Cemetery, located at 4005 Walker Road, just outside Harrow. The name of the church, Central Grove, has a special meaning in the Black community. Central to the Black community and Grove, a stand of trees. The first services were held in the Grove, can kind of see the bush behind the marker there at the cemetery site. Sometimes these camp meetings, as they were called, lasted up to three weeks. The beginning of the church was the result of members of the church at Gilgal, which we'll speak about in a moment, deciding they would re search for property to build a new African Methodist Episcopal Church in Colchester South after several other members left to establish a British Methodist Episcopal Church in the Amherstburg area. Around 1880, William McCurdy donated a, a portion of the south end of his property for the cemetery on the fourth concession near Walker Road. In 1888, trustees of the prospective church person purchased the pre present site next to Mr. McCurdy's property for $200 lawful Canadian money from Thomas Larrabee. The signers of the deed, all ex-slaves were James Johnson, Henry Graham, Peter Jackson, James Walker Dennis, and Squire Hamilton. The pastor at the time was the Reverend Joseph O'Banion, who was buried in the Harrow BME Church. O'Banion was famous for starting the O'Banion Gospel Singers, a group who actually sang before Queen Victoria. One of the notables buried in the cemetery grounds is Anthony Banks who was born free in Colchester in 1840. The Banks family claimed to have never been enslaved and they have documentation. According to family lore, the Banks are descendants of Major General Sir Isaac Brock and his cook, Elminia Malouis, who was said to be a princess from Ghana, West Africa. Today, there are over 250 descendants still living in the Harrow area. Next is Gilgal, or Taylor Cemetery, as it's called, on Walker Road, County Road 11. The first African Methodist Episcopal Church built near Harrow in Colchester South circa 1852 at Gilgal was about 2.5 miles, five kilometers north from the present Central Grove Church site. Reverend William Alexander Kersey was the pastor. He and other presenters helped to build this church. When the building was finished, it was used for worship on Sundays and as a schoolroom the rest of the Delos Rojas Davis, fireman and Civil War veteran, 
taught school here before he was accepted to the bar as a lawyer in 1886. Essex County's first black lawyer, and he's buried at New Canaan. The cemetery located north of the building on the opposite side of the road from uh, that site. Uh, Gilgal Cemetery is also known as Taylor Cemetery because the only remaining marker bears the name of Gilbert Taylor. The original church lot was laid out to hold up to 500 plots. This cemetery site has been encroached upon over the years, time to time, by farmers, neglectful of the sacredness of the site. Now we come to the North American Black Historical North American Black Historical Now Amherstburg Freedom Museum. It's a mouthful. Uh, the, at the Nazare Church National Historic Site at 277 King Street in Amherstburg, Ontario. We're a little bit outside the town of Essex at this time. However, this is an important site because Nazare is the first National Historic Site dedicated to Black history in the history of this country in 2000. The simple Fieldstone Chapel, and now part of the Amherstburg Freedom Museum complex. It is remarkable as an expression of the determination of the Underground Railroad refugees who settled in this area. The church, first built in 1833, has been restored for special religious cemeteries and a part of the museum's mandate to present the history of the local Black community. The dedication of the church was in September 2000. Behind the church is a memorial cemetery. That's also why I'm speaking about this place. Piece together markers from a small Black settlement located on the sixth concession in Malden Township, which was active until 18, excuse me, 1937. This property is now a part of um, a farmer's field as well. Next. is the Puce Memorial Cemetery located on County Road 42. Established in 1850, this cemetery is a significant Black heritage location. It is believed that slaves who have undergrounded, who escaped through the Underground Railroad are buried here. Support for escaped slaves was offered through the Refugee Home Society. This abolitionist organization provided fugitive slaves with a chance to win land and become self-sufficient. Beginning in 1853, families could purchase 25 acre farm lots in Maidstone Township from the society, which also set aside a portion of lands for the construction of schools and churches. By 1850, there was a large Black community in the Puce area, which provided the chief sources of hired help on the farms of Scottish settlers. At least three churches and one school was established in the Puce River area. At Puce Memorial Cemetery, there is a tombstone which is special to me. It is Elizabeth Lee, and it reads, wife of Ludwell Lee, and their son, James. Uh, this marker is under reconstruction.
Ludwell Lee's mother, Kissy, Kasaya was her proper name, was born in 1798, the daughter of Henry Light Horse Harry Lee and an unknown slave woman and a half sister to General Robert E. Lee, the Confederate Army commander during the Civil War. I and my family are descendants. Now we're going to have a little look at the Puce River Black Community Cemetery site on County Road 42 in Lakeshore Township. While the Blacks arrived in the Puce area during the 1830s, the community owes its existence largely, again, to the Refugee Home Society. This abolitionist organization was led by Henry and Mary Bibb. Henry had been a seven times escaped slave, who offered support to escaped slaves who traveled to this area from the United States through the Underground Railroad, again, providing opportunities for land ownership and self-sufficiency. Families purchased 10 hectare farms in Sandwich and Maidstone Township from the society. And again, land was set aside for the construction of schools and churches. In 1872, the Refugee Home Society dedicated 0.2 hectares of property to the trustees of the British, Mes British Methodist Episcopal Church. And a church and cemetery were established on this site and served the Puce River Black community until the late 1920s. An African Methodist Episcopal Church was also located to the east. Now the marker that you're looking at, the blue and gold marker is from the Ontario Heritage Trust. And this cemetery is provincially an historic site. Within this uh, site is a marker that reads, born a slave in Kentucky, the only remaining marker in the Puce River Black Community Cemetery on County Road 42. This marker was stolen and returned and replaced defiantly there. I've traveled all over Canada and the United States. In Canada, I have never seen another marker stating boldly that a person had been born in slavery. The tombstone belonged to Lewis Jackson, who was born a slave in Kentucky, escaped to Canada via the Underground Railroad and settled in Maidstone on the eighth concession Jackson was reportedly the brother of Henry Bibb, the famous freedom fighter and publisher of the newspaper, Voice of the Fugitive. Henry was also the purchasing agent for the Home Refugee Society. Jackson had pride in his progress from enslavement to freedom and affluence. Look at this marker. The caliber of it was costly at that time period. Another site is the Shiloh Baptist Church Cemetery located within the Kingsville Memorial Gardens on North Division Road in Gossville Township near Kingsville. The wording on this marker was written by myself and purchased through a group led by Ken Turner, uh, a local 
cemetery buff. In 2005, an amateur dig was carried out at this site by Ken and Yvonne Turner, myself, and a few other Essex County Historical Cemetery Preservation Society volunteers. All that was found were a few old bottles, rusted implement parts, and the base of a grave marker, but the proof of the cemetery was established. Through the efforts of this group, heritage status was given by the town of Kingsville. Chiseled in stone. I don't know if you've ever heard that comment. It comes from ancient Delphi in Greece, where masters would have their slaves' freedom chiseled in stone. I was there and I read them. And chiseled in stone here are the names and lot numbers and concessions of our pioneering forefathers so that families seeking their roots can locate where their ancestors first settled in Gosfield Township. Next is the John Freeman Walls Historic Site, located at 859 Puce Road, Mainstone Township. This site is, was built and owned and operated by the descendants of John Freeman Walls. In 1846, John Freeman Walls, a fugitive slave from North Carolina, built a log cabin on purchased property from the Her Refugee Home Society. The cabin subsequently served as a terminal on the Underground Railroad and the first meeting place for the Puce Baptist Church. Although many former enslaved persons returned to the United States following the Civil War, Walls and his family chose to remain in Canada. The story of their struggles forms the basis of the book that Road that led to freedom by Dr. Brian Walls. Lastly, we're going to have a little look at the Smith Banwell Cemetery on Banwell Road in Tecumseh. This site is also a provincial heritage site through the Ontario Heritage Trust. A small cemetery was found on Banwell Road in the area described as Negro Lot 143. It is on the west side of Banwell Road, about 0.25 kilometers from the railroad tracks, heading away from the EC Row Expressway. The oldest stone is that of James F. Ross, born in 1886. 1866, excuse me, and died in 1908. The most recent was that of Amanda J. Rye, who was a Smith, who died in 1952. Glenn Smith and Glenn Cook and Elise Harding Davis are shown at the cemetery honoring the Banwell Road Black Cemetery. Cook's ancestors are buried there. This slide just shows a few other African-Canadian cemeteries of significance in Essex County. Hopetown Cemetery, approximate location for this cemetery is within the Hopetown settlement near the third concession at Drummond Road in Colchester Township, Essex. Heavenly Rest of Catholic Cemeteries has Black Remain. Rose Hill Cemetery in Amherstburg also has Black Remains. Windsor Memorial Gardens and Crematorium in Windsor, again, holds Black Remains. 
and St. John's Church, the Anglican Church and Cemetery on Sandwich Street in Windsor has black remains as well. In praise of Canada's fourth group of pioneers, there are the British, the French, the Aboriginal, and ourselves, the black thread in the Canadian tapestry. In the picture, some of the people might be known. At the time, it represented close to 350 years in the ages of the people contained in the picture. I won't say who was what at that time. There was Ivy Johnson and Glavanna Brooks Johnson in the front, uh, a local historian herself who collected information on Black United Empire loyalists. And in the front was myself and Fred Johnson, a local dynamo, a storyteller of great renown in our society. Today's Essex County, African Canadians continue to live in many of their historical places of settlement on original land grants. Although many have moved to larger urban areas, founding families such as Bayless, Banks, Cook, Davis, Henderson, Jacobs, Johnson, Matthews, Mulder, Scott, Simpson, Talbot and Walls continue their cultural traditions. They have built strong communities which speak to their industriousness and ability to endure against all odds. Lost cemeteries keep their history alive. I want to thank the town of Essex again for giving me the opportunity to share some of my history with you. And I hope you have enjoyed this presentation and we'll take a little ride around the county, to see where we're all situated and we all belong here together. Black, white, indigenous, building a better country in the future. And Elise, on behalf of the town of Essex, we wanna thank you for all the work that you do in promoting these cemeteries and these pioneers. It, it's truly very much appreciated. I hope everyone enjoyed this talk. Um, thank you again to Elise. Thank you for engaging with us tonight. Um, this video is gonna be up on, on our Facebook page, uh, Town of Essex, subscribe, um, and hoping you can share with your friends, your family, and like Elise said, go out and, and explore and learn. It's from all of us, thank you. Good night, thank you so much.